first of all, and I'm, I'm sure plenty of you are going to be dying to know this, what's it like working with the Hova, you know? Uh, I mean, talking the greatest rapper of all time. I mean, my opinion. I mean, he's the greatest. Uh, working with him is extraordinary just because besides his talent and what he does when he's there, which is, I'm telling you folks, this is mind-blowing. This man comes in there, and it's like, it just comes out of the sky. It just materializes. Like, you play the beat, and he'll just sit there, he'll start mumbling. Like, what's he going to do? And he'll just be like, the mic on. Then he'll just go in and just open his mouth, and this, this, it just comes out that way. Like, there's no punches, there's no nothing. It just, I mean, the gift this man has is just un unbelievable as a songwriter. So besides that, which is incredible to be around and to see, just the way he is as a person is so inspiring because, you know, he was one of the few cats when I first met him, you know, you walk in, you're like, yo, what is it going to be like me in this? Because at the time when I worked on him the first time was in, um, I think it was like 03, we did Dirt Off Your Shoulders for his black album. And um, it's one of the few sessions that I remember that from the jump, I remember Timbaland was like, yo, you, you going to work with Hove, you going to see all I'm like, oh, snap. I work with Jay-Z, oh shit, I gotta get my mind together. So I remember I went, bought some brand new Jordans. I was like, I'm gonna come fresh. I'm gonna come like, <laughs> get my mind, I'm gonna get my mind state in the state to work with Hope. here I go. And um, you know, and I kept thinking like, yo, what's it gonna be like? What's he gonna be like when he comes in? Is he gonna talk? Is he gonna, man, and I had this idea of what this man was gonna be like when he walked into the room. And it was further, it was the furthest thing from the truth. Like, literally, he came in, he was one of the nicest guys. I mean, he literally shook everybody's hand, told everybody, like, yo, man, I appreciate you being here. Oh, you gonna record me today? Oh, okay, that's cool. I'm like, wow. <laughs> this dude is awesome. <laughs> and then, you know, real quick, while, we, while I was working with him, you know, we were working, we were doing Dirt Off Your Shoulders, right? I don't know if a lot of y'all seen the Black Album DVD. Like, yeah, the Fade to Black, right? Yeah, yeah. So... Tim, you saw that part when Timbaland was like playing them all those beats, right? They were in one room and I'm in another room about to record his vocals. So I'm like, you know, this is my shot. And this is one of the guys on my dream list like I wanted to work with. So I'm like, yo, I got to make sure this is going to be just incredible. So I'm going through everything, making sure everything's right. And I have no idea because I haven't recorded anything with him yet. So he comes in, they send the beat. He's doing his behind the room, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, all right, whatever. I'm ready to go. I'm like a little nervous, but... Man, he goes into, he's like, the mic on, yeah, hey, yeah, he goes in, hit record, starts. Literally, first take, he does the intro, first verse, hook, second verse, redoes the hook, does eight bars of the third verse. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> like, you can't be serious. He's like, yo, play it back, and I'm not sure if I like that yet, but just play it back and let me jump in and finish it. Goes back and listens to it. I punch him in, finishes the third verse, redoes the hook. I'm like, yo, this literally took like 10 minutes. So he's like, yo, I don't really like, like that. I'm a, something happened. He's like, yo, I'm going to change it. I don't really like that verse. It's not sitting well. Yo, he goes in. We're about to redo the third verse. And the mic explodes. Like, folks, I'm not making this up. Like, poof, smoke is out of the microphone. I'm like... <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, Hove just killed the mic. I'm like, this dude just killed the mic. Like, he literally killed the mic. Smoke. I mean, it evaporated. So, I'm tripping. I'm like, yo, I'm telling you, sister, yo, go grab another mic. Go grab. So, I'm freaking out, right? I'm in full panic mode now because I'm like, yo, the mic just blew up. This dude is like killing the song and I'm about to screw it all up. So, I'm like, yo, you know, hit the talk back. I'm like, you know, Hove, uh, I think the mic just died. Um, he's like, oh, cool. I'm going to go get something to eat. Just chill. I'm like, so I'm still panicking at this point. I'm like, yo. But yo, cool. Sits down, starts eating. Like, the assistant goes, puts the mic up. So now I'm in a predicament because I'm like, yo, I got to I gotta make this the vocal kind of match, right? I got a different mic. It's going to sound different. So I'm like, oh, I got to figure this out. So literally, he sees the assistant going with the mic. And what does he do? He walks in behind him. So I'm like, oh, my God. I ain't going to have no time to do nothing. So the craziest thing happens, right? I put the mic, I'm like trying to match it, and he says something. And if y'all ever see that DVD, you'll notice that there's the, the console's right in front of me, but facing the booth, I had like a controller, a Pro Tools controller. And he said something, and I'm literally on one side of the room, 
And something in me just said, man, you need to hit record now. And like, literally, it was like slow motion, like, doom, 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 doom. I like, I literally dove, I almost hit my head on like a piece of gear that was sitting there. And I just hit record. And that's when you hear, you're now tuned to the motherfucking greatest. And if you hear that, you hear like I cut off just a little bit of the intro because it's literally, he said it right when I hit record. So I went, put it on front of the song. I muted it, didn't let him hear it. And he goes and does the verse. So while he's sitting there listening back and doing stuff, I, I did all the breaks and all the transitions you hear. Now, this is going to come out. He's probably going to see us and be like, oh, you got me. But what they didn't know is while he was listening back and they were kind of like doing other things, I was in there doing all the breaks and all the transitions and all the mutes and all, even that third, in the third verse when the beat slowed down. So I was doing all that, but they, they didn't know I was doing that. So when Tim came into the room to hear it, Man, I played it. You know, two, three, my brain. Boom, do, do, do. They were like, what? <laughs> Dudes are going crazy. And then, like, he literally, you know, I did all the drops, all the breaks, and, and I'm acting like I'm doing this on the fly. And I ain't, I ain't doing it on the fly. I already had it in there. But I was acting the hell out of it, though. But I was hitting the console like it was doing the breaks and stuff. They were like, yo, this dude is tripping. This dude is incredible. <laughs> yo, real story. I ain't gonna front. Real story. Tell you the truth. I ain't see him again until literally before we started this album at 11. Now, mind you, this is the, this is a lesson I learned, and I didn't really reinforce it to that moment when I saw him again, like how important first impressions are on people. Because I didn't get to work with him on the Blueprint 3 because I was doing something else. Didn't see him again to the beginning of this album. And I hadn't seen any of them for a minute. I walked in that room, and the man's like, oh, man, the prodigal son returned, like all excited. So I'm like, yo, I got so much pressure because now this dude thinks I'm like, Superman, right? <laughs> so luckily for me, you know, I was able to, to capitalize on that. And uh, I mean, man, it's been an incredible experience working with like the greatest. I mean, he's the greatest. He was on my top of my list because I, I grew up as, you know, into urban music. So working with him was just, psh, it's just unreal. So I went on a tangent, but I had to tell that story. No, we allow tangents and we welcome any tangent you can provide. So, but obviously you didn't, you didn't start like that, right? So you, as we all know, he's, he's alumni, right? So we're happy about that. So really for uh, students that are, that are out here now, what's a piece of advice that you could give them? What's something that you did? Like, cause you have your education, but then there's this whole world after this, this institution. So how do you transition from I'm a student into working professional? Well, I'll tell you what. There's a lot that goes into the formula for that. How many of y'all are recording in audio, guys, and girls? Sorry. Anybody film or any, anything else? Any other programs besides audio in here? Entertainment business? Music business. Music business. So everybody in here is pretty much music-based, all right? Okay, cool. Okay, sweet. Um, look, the one piece of advice I will give you, and it's probably the one thing that has gotten me not only to achieve great things in my career, but also in life. And that is along that road to success. And folks, I'm telling you right now, it's a very long road. And what you're learning here is just a small piece of the equation that you're going to need to implement in order to succeed. There is a lot of things in life that will be thrown at you, especially in your career in the pursuit of what you're doing. Countless times there will be obstacles and roadblocks in front of you that you can't even believe can manifest as fast as they are but they will be. And along those lines, you will find countless people that will doubt you, will tell you you can't be done, will tell you that many have failed before you, and you will be one of them. They will tell you everything possible to deter you from getting the things you want. And when I tell you, they come by the swarms. You won't even believe where they start coming at them. I mean, you'll be coming home and they'll be literally under your bed like, man, you know you ain't gonna make it, right? <laughs> you know it ain't never gonna happen, right? You know, you can't make it. Music industry's folding. Oh, this, 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 blah, 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 blah. It goes on and on and on. The single thing never, that I never, that I would recommend that you implement into your life at this very moment is belief. Belief, most importantly, in yourself. Because that is the only thing that matters. If you can sit there and you can look at yourself in the mirror and be like, I don't care what anybody says, this is going to happen. And you truly believe that, it will happen. Thoughts actually do become things. But when you sit there and let those people get to you and you start doubting yourself, it will not happen. And everything you will do now will be for nothing. So if you really, 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 you're committed because you're here. You're all vested in this. I mean, there's no doubt y'all want something. You have a dream of some point or another that you want to accomplish. 
But in order to make that happen, the most important part is not what's going to happen after you leave here, is what you are doing every single day when you look at yourself in the mirror and the belief that you instill in yourself. If you do that, no matter what, it might take you two years, it might take you three, it might take you 10, but you know what, eventually you'll get there. And that's all that matters. Inch by inch, it is a cinch. And that's all that matters. Awesome. So just to remind you too, I'm going to ask more questions, but I'm sure some of you have some. So if you do, Andy's back there with the mic and we welcome it. So we'll make time for him. Otherwise, I'm going to keep trucking along with my little iPad right here. What you know about the iPad? All right. So, right. Character this guy. Huh? You got to love it. So, but so in any event, that's, that's what you instilled in yourself and you made that happen. But uh, what would you say was really like a, like a pinnacle changing point in your career where you're like, all right, this is like, I've done a couple sessions. I may have worked on a few albums but when you felt like, all right, there's no going back. Like this, like I'm, I'm in it and this is how I'm going to make my bread. Because you got to pay loans. You guys all know all this kind of stuff, right? Yeah. So you keep yourself focused. So what was the, what was the turning point where you're like, th that's well, it? I think for me, everything is kind of goal-based. You know, I left when I was here. I think some of you have seen me speak before. I know you, you saw me speak before. And I, I, I always say the same thing. Like when I was here... You know, about somewhere between the eighth and ninth month, I started going, all right, well, now I got to formulate the plan for this. Like, you know, just going out there and being like, I'm going to be a super producer is not going to, you know, it's not going to turn into anything. I actually got to formulate some kind of plan and structure in order to make this happen. So I sat there and wrote a long list of goals. And folks, I tell you, this laundry list of goals was ridiculous. I mean, I wrote things down on that paper that I was just like, for my career, that was just like, <laughs> okay, I'm over, I'm stretching here. But I left it on there, and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to leave it on there, and I'm going to do all these things. Uh, the top of that list, when I was like, okay, great. I want to work with all these artists. What is it that I want to do? was like, well, where are all these artists at? And then I started looking at all the records that I like. and started looking, where are the, where's the studios at? Where are they at? They're in New York. Are they in L.A.? Where's it? And it was like, oh, well, snap. There's the Hit Factory. And I was like, hmm, the Hit Factory's in New York. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I really want to go to New York. Then I found out the Hit Factory bought Criteria in Miami, and I was just like, oh, okay. It's like the stars and moon have just aligned. So I gave myself a five-year plan to be like, well, in five years, if I haven't gotten it together enough to, in order to work at the Hit Factory and be able to make it happen, then I might as well just hang it up. It ain't going to happen. Fortunately for me, the, um, what, I joined in July, so August 28th, I started my employment there. So mind you. Talk about getting like a breakthrough goal, like being on the fast track, like five year plan, one month in, like, whew. I was like, yo, know, battery packed at that point. I was jacked. I was like, yo, ain't nothing that's gonna stop me at this point. Like, so that, that was a turning point. But then some unfortunate happened to me. Literally, my first week there, Michael Jackson had just finished the uh, Invisible album, I think was the last record he did. Rodney Jerkins, Teddy Riley were there constantly. Um, Everybody was there. I mean, there was literally six rooms and 12 different sessions going on at a time. Everybody from, from uh, Gloria Stefan to every Spanish artist you find during the day, all Urban Acts, everything. I mean, it was simply, I was sitting there going like, oh man, this is it. This is going to happen. And then September 11th happened. And uh, it went ghost for like eight or nine months. And my belief definitely got tested there because there were other people that I thought were extremely talented that were working there that just was like, yo, I can't, I can't do it anymore. This, this ain't never going to recover. Fortunately for, for me, I stuck it through. And by sticking it through, when it did come around, I was in the position that now I was having the opportunities to work with some of these artists because there was nobody else there that had been there that long. Everybody jumped ship. So, you know, I was committed. I was like, well, if this is the Titanic, then let it behold, I'm going to be the captain at the bottom of the ship because this is it. This is what I'm, I'm, I'm besting my eggs all in this basket. And, you know, from there, man, there have been countless breakthroughs, you know. Fortunately for me, I got my first engineering break maybe like eight months in. And then from there, I just kept working and working and working and ended up working out. So there's been a lot of goals, a lot of things that I've set back. I mean, being able to produce the Super Bowl with Madonna was like... Psh, the Super Bowl, like, you know, 140 million people are going to see this. So I've had a lot of moments like that, but that particular one, getting that job, setting that goal, you know, setting that big breakthrough goal, that was like throwing a 50-yard pass and completing it in the first play of the game. Like, it was big. So, And I think we have some questions, but okay. right, right before we switch to that, I got to ask you, do you still have that paper? 
Because you said you wrote them down, oh, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you still have this paper to this day. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's nice hung up in my office. Nice there you go. It up. So you're just crossing? Oh, they're all crossed off. There you go. <laughs> See? They're all crossed I'm off. I'm telling you. It's yeah. going to happen. All right, cool. So we got a question back here. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to ask. Obviously, uh, you're a Fuso graduate, right? Mm -hmm. So I can, I can imagine that from Fuso, you learn a lot. Now, would you be able to tell me if you learn more in Fuso or when you actually went into the field as an internship? Or where, where do you get the most curve of learning? Oh, absolutely. That's a great question. You know, I, I did quite well for myself when I was here. Graduated top of my class. I was literally like a point two away from valedictorian. Like I was like, man, I'm gonna go for blood when I'm here. I got two course directors award. I was, I thought like I knew everything. And then I got that job. And in the first two weeks, I was blown away. I was like, I don't know Jack, like at all. Cause you, what you learn here is a very, it's a good foundation that you can fall back on. And you can always relate to like signal flow, for instance. Like, you know, okay, well, this will help me work through problems. And it, there's a lot of things in there that were key to helping me. But man, I tell you, I learned my first two weeks more on the job than I did my whole, well, back then it was 11 months of being in this program. And it's funny because I tell that story to people and they're like, man, don't you feel stupid? Like, you could have just spent the 40000 and rented a studio and got an engineer to teach you that for two weeks. I say, yeah, you're probably right. And I probably would have learned a lot that way too. But I would have never got that job because I'll tell you, when he, that hit fact, the, the hit factory, they saw that full sale grad and saw all those things on there. And that's what opened the door for me. They were like, well, we know what we're getting from here. And this kid looks like he has some things going for him. So let's give him a shot. So, yeah, you learn a lot more when you're out in the field. I mean, experience pays. You can't, you, you're, in a, you're in a controlled environment here that you're protected. You make a mistake, even if you break something, it ain't the end of the world. Guess what, man? You ain't got that luxury when you're, at, when you're on the field. Like, boy, it's like the art of war. <laughs> you got to be on your P's and Q's all the time. So it's great having that pressure. You excel. Thanks. Thank you. How you doing, uh, Demo? Uh, my you? name is Kalanji. What's um, up, buddy? So I'm, uh, I'm a producer. I'm about to graduate soon. So... I was just wondering, like, on the, um, you know, I, I, I do the, the, you know, learning about the mixing and all that also, but, like, mm -hmm. my main thing is I want to become, you know, just a producer. And I mean, I already am a producer, but, you know, I wanted to be successful at that. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to ask you as far as I know that um, Timbaland works with, uh, you know, different writers and stuff like that, like, you know, Jim Beans or, you know, like The Clutch and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So um, I just wanted to ask you, is, is that, like, you know, a good route to go upon as far as like, you know, if you're trying to become a pro uh, producer, as far as like finding good writers like a Jim Beans and doing stuff with them like on a consistent basis? Oh, well, there's a couple things to your question. It's funny, I was just actually with Jim Beans last week and uh, that guy is just, he's unreal how good that guy is. Um, to be a producer is really a state of mind, but to be a super producer, like few people, like Timbaland, the Pharrells of the world, um, those people surround themselves with even greater people that are really great at what they do. They got a group of people that they know are the best in every position they do, and they can rely on them. And that's why they're so effective. In order to be a producer, it, there's a lot of things that go into play. Like, I don't know, do you play music? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm learning the piano, but I just, okay. I, I, have a, I have a good ear, so I, okay. I find my way. You know? That's like me. I don't know. I can't play nothing. Like, I know, I learned about instrumentation and key and all that from learning from doing it, but I don't, I never learned how to play anything. And uh, so I relied a lot on my engineering practice in order to open the doors for me as a producer. So you got to kind of find a niche. You got to find what you're good at. You got to find what your strengths are and you got you to expose your strengths, not focus so much on your weaknesses. And if you could align yourself with a producer like Timbaland, shoot, man, you're off to the races if you can do that. But, uh, you know, it's up to you. More depends on what you want to do. All right, thanks. You're welcome. Any more? Yeah, I think we got a third. Yeah, I have a, this is a question from Twitter. It's from Clara Ann. She wants to know, have you ever felt like you didn't belong amongst the artists you were working with when you first started out? Let me think about that. 
Well, I always felt like I belonged, but did I actually feel like I belonged amongst them? Do you know, I don't ever think I really gave it any thought. I was too busy just trying to do my job and making sure that I executed. Like, you know, when you're in a room with superstars and people that are used to great things happening at the drop of a hat, you really didn't got time to fit in. You're too busy trying to do the best you can do. And for me, that's really all I ever focus on. Even now, like when I'm in a room, it doesn't matter to me who I'm in the room with. I just know I got my job to do. And whatever my title may be, I know I'm there for that particular reason. I'm there for my expertise. So I ain't really trying to fit in and trying to really get comfortable. I think that's a big mistake a lot of people make. I saw a lot of people, they get comfortable too fast. Like they build a rapport or they have a relationship with an artist, producer, engineer, whoever. And then they kind of forget like, yo, this is your employer. Like you're here because of that person. And at any given moment, you might do something that you didn't even realize was that serious and just might have slipped and rubbed them the wrong way. And guess what? Now you're out of a job. So I've never been that comfortable in my job, even though I'm comfortable in what I do. But if I'm, you know, I'm, I'm Madonna's one of my best friends. So is Timbaland. But like when I'm in the studio with them, like that's my boss. Like, yo, what do you need? Let's make it happen. This is what it is. And keep it moving. So I don't know if you should worry too much about fitting in. Just worry about doing the best you can do and you'll probably be all right. Hey, how you doing? My name's Brian. Hey, Brian. Um, I just want to know, how important was it for you to network within the classroom, you know, with other students? And were you also, like, really open-minded? Sorry, I didn't get the first part of your question. Say how, like, how were you networking with other students when you were in classroom and, uh, you know, learning how to become an engineer and all this stuff? Mm -hmm. How important was it for you to network and develop projects outside of Fulsa so it could get you into this position that you are? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. When I was here, like, folks, I, I lived right here in Sutton Place. I got that apartment because I was just like, yo, I, I wanted to be as close to school. I would have lived here if they had dorms because I was like, yo, I'm not even trying to go anywhere else outside of here. So the first thing I did, I don't know if they still do it now in audio, but back then the first three months you had everybody. You had film, you had everybody in with you. You still do that? So I spent those first three months just in the cut, just watching everybody, seeing like who were the people that were really taking it serious because I'm sure y'all have all looked around and been like, oh man, this person don't want it that bad. Or like, oh, man, this person ain't taking it serious. Like, it, it happens. And uh, I sat back and I watched, and I handpicked my lab mates. Like, my, I'm telling you, like, when I tell you it was competitive within my lab group, I surrounded myself with people that I knew knew more than me, that were better than me, in a lot of sense as far as music. I, if I, I, didn't, I wasn't a musician, guess what? Every one of my lab mates were musicians. So I surrounded myself with all, my, all the things that I felt I was weak at, and I was with these people all the time. And I made sure the people that didn't look like they wanted it, I did, they weren't even in my radius. I didn't, you know, I was cool with everybody. I'm still cool with everybody, but I just, yo, we can't hang out. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can't come to my house and study. Like, <laughs> nah, <laughs> that ain't going down. So I networked, but I was, you know, I did what I could do when I can do it. Most of the time I was worrying about making sure I got the best grades I could, I could studied the best, and hung with like a group of people that were just excellent. And... They're a big reason why I was able to accomplish all the things I was able to accomplish here. Thank you. All right, all right. So we'll move right along. Great questions, by the way. Keep yeah, them thanks. coming. So <clears throat> you have, just by looking at your credits, a pretty diverse, even though you said you like urban music and you, yeah. you've kind of come up in that. Um, you know, how do you uh, personally go about when you have to switch roles from, let's say, maybe being the engineer mm -hmm. to now i got to switch my mind state and be a producer, uh, what is that like the first time out, I guess you could say, on, on a pro level, of having to switch gears from one to the other? It's tough. One of the reasons I was able to accomplish so many things so quickly was I was able to wear a lot of hats. So literally, like, one day, I'd be the engineer. One day, I'd be the mixer. Next thing, I was the programmer. Next thing, I was a producer. Someday, I was the babysitter. Someday, I was a chef. <laughs> like, I had to do whatever I had to do in order to keep it, keep it going. And it's a balancing act, and it takes practice. But when you're in it, you just figure it out as you go. If you make a mistake, that's the thing. You can't really be afraid of making mistakes because that's when you actually learn the most about yourself is when you make that one mistake where you're like, oh, my God, it's the end of the world. I'm done. It's over. And you realize it ain't really that serious. You ain't kill nobody. Life will go on. And you learn, and then you don't make those mistakes anymore. Like, mind you, you're always going to make mistakes. I make them. Once in a while, and 
And I get some shit for them, I tell you. They could be on me, boy. Like, oh, you did that. It's like, Psh, get out of here. It happens. But, you know, it is what it is. And you just keep it moving. Right. So, and, and that being said, um, you just said something that was really important that I wanted to touch on. So it's one of those things where when you're in the studio environment, it's one of those things where it's like you make a mistake, but you learn to get past that versus harping on just that one thing. So how important that is that in an environment, uh, you're working on a project, you said yourself, oh, I'm with Jay-Z, microphone blew up. But instantaneously you thought of resolving the issue. Yeah. So that's a really important thing to do is problem solve, right? Yeah, Absolutely. I had a great instructor here. Where's Hunter at? Yeah, that's this gentleman right here, d dude. The gold I got from him was unreal. Like, he literally implemented things in my brain. I, I mean, literally, I still wake up sometimes with some Hunterisms in me. Like, I'm like, yo, what the hell is this guy still in my head 14 years later? And so, uh, yeah, he instilled in me that you had to figure it out and you, had, you couldn't be scared in order to, you know, if a, something came about and you... You had to be a tech first, especially being an engineer. You had, to, you had to not be scared in order to get in there. You had to eliminate the fear, buddy. Open the gear. See? Hunterism. Like, genius, right? So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's easy to harp on things. Like, I've been doing a lot of stuff in live, and it's one thing when you're sitting there and you're working on a mega tour and something happens and you're sitting there and you're like, yo, the screen goes out for three songs. You're sitting here like, oh, my God. You know, you got you to gotta get past it, move on. Things are going to happen in all sorts, in the studio, in live, in film, in whatever it is, in TV, it happens. Don't harp on it. You know, you know, you take a minute to recognize a mistake. That way you won't make it again, but just keep it moving. So looking forward to, um, <clears throat> the other thing that I wanted to bring up too is that you've set a list and you said before, these are my goals. So obviously it sounds like you've already scratch some things off the list or did them all. But looking forward, is there any uh, musician or upcoming artist that you're like, man, I hope I, get it. hope I get that opportunity. I hope I bump into them and maybe get a chance to work with them. Yeah, what do you I mean, think? You always want to keep working. Uh, all the big ones for me, I've knocked them out. Uh, the last one being Michael Jackson, which I'm doing a posthumous Michael Jackson album with Timbaland right now as we speak. So that was, you know, I didn't get to work with the man when he was alive, but I feel like he's alive very much so when we're in the studio now working on this record. So I like a lot of the new acts. I like Kendrick, um, Kendrick Lamar. I like, um, I got to work with Macklemore and Ryan Lewis at the Grammys on their performance. I helped them out with that. So, uh, you know, I like to do some stuff with them. There's always people you want to add. The core of the ones I work with are, are pretty much it. Um, Bono and U2 always been on that, been currently on that list that I want to work on, my new list. So hopefully in the future I'll be able to do that. But, you know, there's always new people that inspire you, so you always want to kind of push for that. So we'll see. Sure. And so while we're on that subject too, um, <clears throat> since you were recently at the Grammys and you won, take us to that moment. You're sitting here. <laughs> you're in the arena, right, you. Staples Center. And then all of a sudden they open that envelope. Usually they have a problem, yeah. right? They're figuring it out. Yeah. And then you hear, you hear it. What is that like? Take us there. I mean, the whole night, I, I lost, right? <laughs> I was losing the whole night because Macklemore and Ryan Lewis was sweeping it. And the crazy thing is it was right next to the dressing room right next to me. So imagine how that feels. I'm working on their performance. So I'm like collaborating with them. So I'm happy for them. I'm like, damn. Every time they jump, I'll be like, oh, man, they got another one. So when I saw Jay go up and get that award, I was kind of shell-shocked. I was like, man, is this real? <laughs> like, did we actually win this? So, you know, it's good. It's nice. Look, it's nice to get awards. And it's nice, you know, it's fantastic when you get those, and especially from your peers, the Grammys, that's all great. But uh, that, ain't, that ain't the reason why I do it. And frankly, I have a bunch of plaques. They're all sitting at my mother's house. I don't put any up in my house. Like, they're all great and dandy to have around. And it's good to get achievements, man. But at the end of the day, it's what you do in your work. Like, if you're happy with what you do, that's really what should matter. You know, it's all good to make money and do all those great things and be able to have a fantastic career. But at the end of the day, like, yo, this is a, we're here for a passion, right? This is why we're here. This is why we go through this regime that we're going through right now, is to be able to, to, to go and do things and create art. We're all creators of art. So that, to me, is the most important thing. Love it. Um, <clears throat> now, since you were here from being alumni until current times, obviously... 
things have changed technology wise. Mm -hmm. Things have changed uh, as far as referring to things being more in the box, maybe as opposed to outboard gear. So you had already had your educational background. So what is it like being in the field? Because I'm sure I've heard some students in the hallway and even asked me in the classroom, you know, mm -hmm. hey, when I leave here, some of this stuff might change. And, you know, so how do you balance that? How do you balance what you've learned and what you know and then figure that out maybe right on the spot? Yeah, you got to spend a little bit of time. I mean, you got to literally commit. I say you at least try to commit 20 minutes a day to trying to find something new that you did not know about in your field. So it's just 20 minutes, folks. 20 minutes is about the same amount of time it takes you to brush your teeth and comb your hair or whatever. You just literally go online, go to a blog site, go to a trade magazine, and just pick up one thing. If you pick up one thing a day, you're going to be all right. Like, if you focus too much on, like, trying to keep up with the latest trends and, I mean, like, listen... The new Pro Tools came out, and there's no studio I know that has it. <laughs> like, and I work at all the top studios. Like, none of them have it yet. Like, they have it, but they haven't put it up yet. So it's cool to be up on the times, and it's cool to know what the next hot thing is, but make sure that the things you know you're very good at because those are the things you're going to have to use. Like, I literally own probably, I don't know, every freaking plugin that's ever been made, and I use, like, four. You know, like... <laughs> Like, seriously, you, like, you open it up, the thing's like, shh. It's like, I go to the same ones <laughs> every time. I might incorporate one new one, like, once in a while. Like, oh, this is kind of cool. And, but, you know, don't get caught up too much in the technology. Just try to, try to learn more about what's going on and what people are doing. Like, reading up on what so-and-so is mixing and, like, his approach. Because that approach, you might be like, oh, okay, that could work for me. Let me try to put that in and try to use some of it. I mean, I've learned a lot. Shoot, like, y'all are very fortunate. What y'all don't know is there's another superstar in this building right now, and that gentleman is sitting right back there. Another Hall of Famer, Mr. Leslie, who uh, I'm just going to comment on some. It's funny, right, because when I was here, like, this is the dude, right? This is the dude on the magazine. This is the dude I was reading about. I was like, yo, he's working on all the projects. Yo, this dude's the man. And, like, here he is now. It's like a dream come true, right, for me. So it's been quite a, it's been quite a ride, but he, I'm sure he'll tell you. It's like... Use what you're good at and get really good at that and then incorporate everything else at the same time. All right. So it looks like we got some questions back there. So go ahead. Uh, my name is Glenn Lee. I go by G. Um, I had an outboard gear question for you. I was okay. wondering, um, what's your favorite mic pre and mic to use? That's funny. Somebody just asked me that. It used to be the Neve series, all the ne old Neve stuff, the 1073, 1081s. But lately, I've liked the Martech. Uh, I think it's NSS10 is what it is. I like that. It's been it's been working for me, so I've been using that. And uh, what was the other question? Uh, your favorite mic to use? Man, I like the Neumann U87. I still think that's the most versatile mic on the planet. Like, if I had to go to war and I had that mic, I feel pretty good that I could do anything with that mic. Word. That and believe it or not, a 57 can get you a long way too. If you're on the road, the 57 is a workhorse. I've literally dropped that thing in a bucket of water. Like, literally, like, I, don't ask me how a bucket of water ended up by where I was, but literally it fell in a bucket of water, and I'm like, oh, snap, and it was the only one. Dried it up, plugged it in, and it worked. I was like, yo. <laughs> That's good equipment right there. Yeah. <laughs> they, make, they make that stuff to last, man. How about it? I think we got a second one, so go ahead. How you doing, man? Uh, my name is Sonny. I'm uh, actually be graduating maybe like nine, 10 months. And I'm asking the question about you working in Hit Factory. Mm -hmm. You said, now before you graduated, when did you start contacting Hit Factory or any studio per Good se? Question. Um, I started early. I started somewhere within the ninth or 10th. Well, I graduated in the 11th month, so probably the eighth or ninth month around there. I started making my rounds with career development. And, um, you know, I'd never had a job before. I worked like like nonsense security like in college when I was there for a little bit but I, I never had no job I didn't even know what a resume was or what it looked like so they were instrumental in helping me put that all together and you know if you make the effort and people believe that you're serious even while you're here they're going to take you serious not only here but in life and I was very you know persistent on going over there being like, uh, I really want to work at these places. Like, what do y'all have? They're like, yo, we just told you, come back next week. Oh, all right, I got to talk to somebody else. Now. <laughs> you know, and I'd go and I'd hound everybody. Even people that weren't my advisors were like, yo, what are you doing? <laughs> go see so-and-so. I'm like, oh, okay. So I just, man, I just kept going. And I just, and I, I did a lot of research. I mean, they have a lot of the tools already. And if you, you don't have to do this. This was just something I did, but 
trust me, they got it. They, they know what you want. They could probably facilitate better. But I just did the research. And it ended up working out pretty good for me because the thing that I think got me that job was, one, I signed up for a Pro Tools certification course, which wasn't, you didn't get that when you were here before. That was extra. So I went and did that literally the first week when I got out of full set. I went and did that. So I was like one of the first people that they had seen that had that. So that was a bit, it gave me a bit of an edge. And the other thing was I knew the entire back history for the past seven months because I kept researching who was there. So I was just like, yeah, Jada Kiss just did blah, blah, blah there and da, da, da. And the studio manager was like, yeah, what? How, how you know that? Right. So that helped. That helped right. a lot. Thanks, man. Oh, you're welcome. All right. I think we got someone from Twitter here, right? Um, someone else from Twitter, Alex Knight. He Alex wants Knight. to know, what are the best steps to take once you graduate to be an artist if you can't get a job in a studio? To be an artist. <clears throat> well, work on your craft, get better. Explore every avenue. If you're, um, you know, if you're an artist that, that's used to playing out in the open or, or you want to go and explore that option, you got you to gotta figure out first what you want to do. You want to sell CDs, you want to go on tour, you want to do everything, you want to do nothing. Like, what is it that you want to do? Once you figure that out, draw up a plan. Like, all right, I'm going to get and put, you know, set some goals and put some dates on it. Like, yo, I'm going to get a booking agent by so-and-so date at this time. And then I'm going to look for a manager. You know, you need a manager, you need an accountant, you need a booking agent. Those three people are pretty key. If you get those three people and you get the right ones, you're good to go. And if you still need more info, then you need to go read uh, um, All You Need to Know About the Music Business by Donald S. Passman. And that will uh, answer any other questions. I was kind of going to ask, like, the selective working, like, where you ever had a time that you had, like, a person coming to you, like, wanting you to record them and you said, no, because you wanted to record someone else, like... <laughs> yeah, that happens quite a bit now. It didn't used to happen before, man. Shoot, before you take anybody that comes work, like, yo, can you work my session? Like, you have four sessions, like, yeah, yeah, I'll work it. I'll work whatever I need. And like, yeah, now I'm, I'm a lot more pickier with who I choose to work with. Um, not because I don't want to do the work. It's just now I try to focus and try to give 100% just to the people particularly that I'm working on. So it's tough, but, you know, I do it. Definitely. All right, we got another question too. All right. All right. So uh, I know everybody wants to like you know know something as far as like mixing is concerned. So you mm -hmm. know, well at least I do. I don't know about y'all, but uh, I just wanted to know as far as like you know your process when you go into you know mix a song. You know, I know often you're there also to record a song also. So you're there through a lot of the whole process. So what is your process? Do you start planning stuff while you're recording? You know, um, and like what you know what what exactly you know is it that you go through? And um, I, this is also part of the question, but also I wanted to ask. Um, I know um, you know. Timberland used to work with Jimmy Douglas before, you know, he was working with, uh, you know, you and uh, you were his main engineer. Did you adopt any of his workflow into what you do currently? It's a great question. Actually, Jimmy was my mentor. Jimmy's the one who, like, broke the door open for me. He was just like, okay. After a while, he was like, okay, you're good enough. You could, you could take the seat. Like, he was like a big thing. Like, like a big old ceremony between me, Tim, and Jimmy. <laughs> like, now you, are, well, now you are one of us. Like... So, yeah, I owe a lot to Jimmy. Jimmy taught me, he, Jimmy really taught me what it, what it was to be an engineer. Like, I, I thought I knew what an engineer was until Jimmy sat down. It was just like, no, I mean, this is a guy who did Foreigner, did Ray Charles, like all the stuff in Atlantic's heyday. This was the guy behind it. So, sitting there and him telling me stuff, I'm like, he taught me more theory and, and philosophy of how to approach things. And, uh, psh, man, I mean, that's like getting gold. Like, here you go. Like, here you go, my son. You're off, you know? Like, <laughs> and so. That was incredible. I, I, I learned a couple things from him. He definitely learned a lot from me, too. Like, I gave him a lot of Pro Tools, like, because I was on it. Like, he, when I met Jimmy, Jimmy was still using Pro Tools like a tape machine. I'm like, yo, whoa, 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 hold on. You ever heard of grid mode? Like, <laughs> yo, check this out. He's like, yo, now I'll teach you more. <laughs> you know, so it's funny because that relationship with Jimmy taught me that, like, yo, whenever you can, you should try to show everybody you can because somebody will in turn, like, once in a while, you know, I always, when I work with my assistants, even if I'm working for the first time, like, you know, I, I try to be like, nah, look, check this out. What do you think of this? Da, da, da. And in return, once in a while, man, they'll give me a gem. They'll be like, so did you know this? 
And I'll be like, yo, <laughs> this is crazy. Like, I just worked on a fantastic assistant, and uh, he worked with me a lot on Jay's album, uh, Raymond, up at Jungle City. And this boy is bad. Like, he taught me some great stuff. He worked on Beyonce's album, too. So he was taking a lot of stuff that he was learning from Stu, Beyonce's engineer, and like, yo, did you know Stu does this? I'm like, yo, keep giving it to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, Stu, I've stolen all your tricks, buddy. <laughs> um, as far as my process, uh, my process has evolved a bit over time to adapt to the workflow and clients' um, expectations of what they expect from me. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know, like today's age, you're fighting the rough mix. People spend six, seven months doing a rough mix, and then they give it to you, and you got two days to beat something that someone's been spending six months on. It's not going to happen. So I've incorporated how to really try to take and and kind of make those rough mixes better because it is a lot. Like my job, maybe 80% of the stuff that I do that isn't a project I'm engineering is like that. They'll get it and they'll be like, I'll be like, you know, this is done, right? You know, like, this is great. Like, what you want me to do? And they're like, well, I think you can make it better. I'm like, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> but uh, I've actually developed, for me, I actually start mixing it. When I'm hearing it and they're playing it for me, I already know, okay, I'm going to take the kick and add this much to it. I'm already kind of mixing it in my head as I'm seeing it. Okay, I'm going to pan that out. Oh, that instrument's kind of buried. I wonder what's in there. Maybe I'll bring some of that up. Vocal needs to go louder. So I kind of already have an idea before I go and do it. And then I still mix on a console, so I still have a lot of fun doing it. So touching knobs is fun for me. So. But I'm not. if you can do it in Pro Tools, that's all great. It's whatever works for you. All right, thanks. Rick. You're welcome. All right, looks like we have some Twitter questions. We have one more from Sophia. She wants to know, what was your breakthrough moment in your career? Meeting Timbaland, for sure. Meeting Timbaland was like, that was it. Um, I got to meet him because I, I used to work with Missy. I was Missy's engineer. And I was working with Missy for probably like six or seven months. And then she's like, yo, I'm going to start an album. And like, Timbaland's coming tomorrow. I'm like, what? For real? And uh, Tim and Jimmy Douglas came, and we were in one studio, and they were, like, across the hall from us. And every second I get, boy, I was sneaking that room and just, like, peep down and see, like, yo, this dude had a stack of records and CDs. So I, was, I could hide easily. I could come into the back door and kind of just watch. And once in a while, he'd catch me, like, what you doing? Like, oh, I'm just micing something. He's like, what you mean, micing? There ain't no mics in here. <laughs> <laughs> you got me. Um, Jimmy was pretty cool about letting me just hang out as long as I wasn't in his way. So, uh, yeah, I got to build a rapport with them. And, and, you know, that album was incredibly successful for her. And um, it established me with him because he was just like, oh, this dude's pretty smart. And then Jimmy was just like, yo, why don't, you know, we should work together. And uh, <laughs> funny story, I'm going to tell you. So the way it worked at the Hit Factory is whatever assistant used to stay with the same client. So Jimmy had one assistant that he was working with, but that assistant had another project that he had a commitment to. So it, it was my turn since I had the relationship with Jimmy to work on a project. Man, first project out. Back then, the Hit Factory had this, uh, this board. It was called the Sony Oxford Digital Board. Only digital room they had. Two assistants, the same two assistants always worked in that room. I mean, they knew that room like the back of their hand. None of us had the opportunity to work in that room. And man, finally we get the shot and they're working in that room. Never been in that room. Don't even got a clue. Last digital console I saw was the one here. So I'm like, okay, we'll make it happen. Day before, the other assistant went in, gave me the ropes. He's like, look, Jimmy works in this mode. It's really simple. Everything will be fine. Don't worry. So he sets up the console. I'm looking, taking notes. It's like, all right. Boy, I don't know if any of y'all gotten the privilege to meet Jimmy Douglas. Jimmy Douglas walks into that room, says, what do we got here? What do we got here? And then he just starts going to work. And he starts hitting, his hands start flying, and he starts hitting every button on the console. I can't write this stuff down fast enough. I'm like in panic mode, like, oh my God, <laughs> what has this man done? What is going on? This is gonna be a disaster. I don't know what Jimmy hit, and apparently Jimmy didn't know what he hit either. <laughs> but we're recording, and that console was made for two engineers, so you can mirror each other. So Jimmy's on one side, the same room, that same room that was, we did uh, Dirt Off Your Shoulders. Jimmy's on one side, Facing that way, working with the songwriter. I'm on the other side. Somehow, don't ask me how, I figured out that the headphone mix was on a different layer. So, yo, the, the girl's snapping at him like, yo, my headphone mix sucks. He's like, yo, I don't understand. What is going on here, Bob? I figured this out. I'm like, it's all good. I'll just mirror him. Yo, I start mirroring him. And what happens? 
he catches me mirroring him. <laughs> Yo, what are you doing? Who told you blah blah? Start snapping. Yo, for some reason it was just an avalanche that came. Everything went wrong at that moment. That man called my boss that day. Folks, I ain't lying. I ain't making this up. 38 times. <laughs> that session started at 12 o'clock at night. I sh was sure I was fired. <laughs> so it's like, it is over. My first shot with Tim. Tim's like, yo, this kid's an idiot. <laughs> like, how did Missy keep him around? I'm sitting here like, yo, this is over. Went the next day. Studio manager's office. I mean, I'm beat up. My, my tail between my legs. I'm coming in like, oh, my God, I'm fired. This is a wrap. This is over. Like, it's over. It's over. No one's ever complained about me. And this man called him 38 times. It is a wrap. I walk in there. He's looking at me like, yo, what happened? <laughs> I'm like, yo, he came in. He started hitting the buns, blah, blah. He's looking at me. Yo, but you didn't even know how to get the headphones. I'm like, oh. I'm like, it's a disaster. He's like, well, look, obviously he wants you off the session. I'm like, yeah, I get it. Uh, whatever. He's like, but every room is swamp. Every assistant swamp. So you're going to have to stick it out. <laughs> Yo, session started at 4 o'clock. I was in his office at 8 o'clock. Folks, by 1030, I knew that console inside and out. I knew that console so well, I was calling the other assistant like, Yo, did you know that this, 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 and this? He's like, yo, how did you figure that out? Well, I just read the manual like 10 times. And just... I literally knew that better than all the other, the other two assistants that were like masters on that board by 1030. What do you think happened when Jimmy came in? Folks, he didn't even look at me. I was just like a ghost. He walked in, didn't acknowledge me. Something went wrong, I'd just jump up. Obviously, now I knew the answer. He would walk out and go to the other studio and grab my fellow peer, the other assistant, out of his session and bring him back <laughs> to tell him what's wrong with the console. He'd be looking at me like, yo, what? I'm just like, <laughs> it's a true story, folks. So I'm sitting here, I'm like, yo, this guy thinks I'm an idiot. They, they, there's no hope here. So what did I do? I, I morphed myself into the wall. I went into a corner, and I just sat there and watched and watched. And I was like, man, how am I going to get a shot here? This dude really thinks I'm incompetent. Tim ain't even acknowledging me at this point. He's just like, oh, it's just dummy just taking up a breathing room. I'm like, oh, man, what am I going to do? So then some dawned on me. He's cutting a demo. And literally, he would go, and they would always break at the same time. And I didn't really realize why. And then one day it dawned on me. He was still working in slip mode. He was still treating this like a tape machine. I'm like, yo. Damn, Jimmy don't know how to put it in grid mode. He don't know, he don't really, he's using this thing as a tape machine. It's limited. He doesn't know the possibilities. So I'm like, man. So I was like, okay, well, there's, there it is, right? There's my end. Now, how am I going to do it? So I just waited. Six, seven, week goes by. Two weeks go by. And uh, I don't know if y'all know this late static major. He was one of the dear friend of mine and one of the greatest writers ever. He uh, passed away a couple years ago. He wrote all the Aaliyah hits it's just an incredible human being he was coming down we were, this time we are working on Brandy's album during this time and uh, he comes in now at that time everybody would break at like 10 o'clock and go to the club and then you know they come back at 4 in the morning session would keep going to like 8 in the morning Jimmy was the only engineer so it just got later and later so yo he started getting tired so Static comes in everybody breaks to the club Static's riding I see Jimmy take off and go upstairs I'm like oh boy here it is here's that big moment right the shot is coming right now he's about to go to sleep I'm about to get my shot man sure enough he went upstairs I'm sitting in that lounge and I can see Static is almost almost ready to get he's in the booth it's just looping he's the first person I saw I never wrote nothing down and he's sitting in there and I could tell the words are coming out I'm like oh any minute now he's gonna come and be like he's ready so I go upstairs, I check, I see Jimmy on that couch. I said, oh, boy, I'm going I'm to take the shot. Here it goes. Man, I came back down in that lounge. Sure enough, two minutes later, started like, you ready? I'm like, yup. Got in there, we start cutting. He's like, wow, this dude is fast. So I start cutting, start cutting. Now, he cuts the whole song, right? Static comes in. Earlier in the day, he told me, yo, I'm going to change the arrangement. I'm going to make the bridge, the hook. I'm going to make the pre-hook, the bridge. He told me he was going to do all this stuff, right? So I made a note of it, already knew what he was going to do, set all my markers, set all my points. I couldn't have, I tell you, this is like fairy tale stuff I'm about to tell you. This really went down the way I'm telling you. He's finishing the last line, and I'm sitting, looking here, doors here, everybody comes in, right? 
Timbaland, everybody sits in, and I see Jimmy sit in Tim's chair that's literally right over my shoulder. Static already told me the arrangement. He comes in the room. He's like, all right, cool. So he comes in. He starts saying, yo, Papa, I need you to do this, this, this. So they're all like, oh, man, it's going to take two hours to do this. Man, I'm like in ninja mode. Pa, 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 boom. I hit that button. That thing played back flawlessly. Everybody was like, Whoa. oh, my God. <laughs> like, yo, like the prodigal son has just appeared. This just went down. Like they're just sitting there like shocked. They never seen that before. They never seen nobody use that. So sure enough, man, Jimmy came over. He's like, hmm, you know, you're good with that <laughs> so you think you can show me how to do that and that's literally how our whole relationship came about he was just like okay you're not an idiot you actually know something <laughs> i was like yo i actually know the console too now check it out and that was it that was finally the icebreaker that made it happen and then three months down the line he passed me the baton he said yo you know what i, I think you know i want to go do other things do you think you'd be willing to work with tim full time and i was like Psst, are you kidding me i knew it was big shoes to fill i mean we're talking going behind a legend you know, when you're in the shadow of a giant, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. But, you know, I was up for the challenge. So thankfully for that man, I got my shot. And that's it. True story, folks. Crazy stuff, huh? And you're making hits today, huh? Yeah. So <clears throat> looking into it, um, you've been obviously working with different producers, different engineers, kind of ironing your way out and kind of learning the ropes. Uh, through all that, it sounds like you've traveled, you've been to some different places yeah, yeah. studio-wise. So I'm sure you know a lot of students would want to know, what is one studio where like you walked in and you were just like, all right, that's a room. I like this. Well, the Hit Factory Studio A is like sick. I mean, you walk in there, this, this room is just mad. That live room is incredible. I mean, they do like 90-piece string orchestrations in there. It's massive, this room. It's probably the one room that left the biggest impression on me. Um, there's been a lot of great studios. Uh, Sony, which isn't around anymore, unfortunately, in New York was like, the when I first worked at Sony, I felt like I had really, I was really doing things. Like I was in there and it was like, Rough Riders were like in one room, like Murder Inc. was in another room. Like I'm sitting there and I was like, wow, I'm in like, this is like Yankee Stadium right now working here at Sony. So Sony was definitely an incredible place to work at. Um, I've gotten to work in a lot of studios overseas. Uh, there's a great studio called SARMS in London that I got to work on Hard Candy that I really enjoyed working at. Um, but, you know, I'm fortunate, man. They're all great, all the places I work at, so I'm very lucky. Awesome. So I know we're uh, cutting close in time, so if you guys have other questions, we'll uh, make room for that. Um, looks like we got one student coming up, so go ahead. Yeah, thank you. It's because I actually want to, like... Uh, see what I can do here in the US and then move on to Europe. So if you could tell me how to spell the studio that you worked in London. So, uh, it's not there no more, I don't think. It's not there. The one I work there now, is, is, that I work at now, is called Metropolis. Metropolis. And it's a beautiful, beautiful facility. In London? In London, yeah. Okay. That's a Thank great spot. And then Abbey Road, you can't go, you know I mean? It's iconic, that studio. So there's a lot of good studios though in London. I mean, those are just the only ones I, I personally know about, but... There's a lot of great facilities in London. There's incredible music being done there constantly. So if that's your destination, it's a good spot. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Yo, what's up, man? What's um, up, buddy? Uh, I got a question more on the uh, mixing side, more on the production side. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm a huge Timbaland fan, and the reason I really like it is because of his drums. Like, his drums are out of control. You know, even starting from 2000, even to right now. Yeah. So my question to you is, do you, know, do you have any tips as to how to get that Timbaland sound <laughs> on sitting in the mix fitting right? You know what I'm saying? Buddy, only Timbaland can get that Timbaland sound, because I'm going to be honest with you. That man will leave his keyboard up, and I will go in there, and I will play with the same patches and do the same thing he does. And if anybody can do it like he does, I can, because I've seen him over and over again do it. And it's something about when that man gets behind that keyboard and hits those keys, the sound changes. I swear to you, man. it's the same patches, the same thing. And it's, I'm not the only one. Everybody that's at work, we've all done the same thing. When he ain't there, he'll leave that keyboard up. We'll be there like, we'll even bob like him trying to get the same thing he's doing. And like, <laughs> yo, it does not happen. That man has something in his fingers that, translates to those drums that creates that like he'll grab a, a, a raggedy triton not that triton's raggedy if you use it but i'm just saying like raggedy in the sense of his drums and he makes those drums sound like the drums you hear Damn. 
And like, and like, yo, what? It's just, yeah, man, that man has a gift. I can't. Uh, well, I mean, well, based off that question, is there anything, any other tips you would suggest? Like, just I, yeah, take the time to create your own. That's what he does. We sit there. We, I mean, we've spent months at a time creating sounds, and uh, that's why it's so unique. A lot of the times, a lot of the records that people really love, we've created those sounds. I mean, shakers out of sandpaper, snares like we're dropping light bulbs and miking them and. And like, yo, we've created a lot of those sounds, so that's why they sound so unique. That's why a lot of times you can hear when he does something and when one of his co-producers does it. Because his stuff, you listen to it, you're like, yo, this dude's from outer space because he really is from outer space. And (laughs) that explains why he can do all those things and they sound incredible. So it's not, would it be uncommon to have like a a drum pattern that has like 26 layers on it, like just for the kick of the... Yo, there's no 26. I mean, he'll do that (laughs) once in a while, but yo, that's one drum, man. Yeah. Okay. That's one drum, one snare. Like he has done that to me, like literally done like 50 drums Damn. in a song. Like I ain't gonna lie. He gave me a track once. I think it was Beautiful Liar for Carrie Hilson. There was 26 kicks in that song. Damn, man. You know what I did? I muted like almost all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I muted all I I literally cut them and like copied the one that I was using in Pro Tools so the the meters kept running. But he ain't know. Like, it was the same kick. <laughs> Just took that junk out of the stereo bus. I'm like, yo, what 26 kicks? Like, get out of here. Like, are you kidding me? Like, 14 snares, 15 hi-hats. Like, yo, using one. That's it. Like, yeah, no. Um, I was just wondering, I know you work with a lot of musical artists, and is there a certain mind state you have to get in for each different one, like, to make them feel comfortable in what no, they're doing? Question. Because I know one time I met you, you said Madonna, like it was five seconds of silence and she's like, what are we doing? Like getting... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah so. absolutely. Um, I tend to, whenever I work with somebody that I've never worked before, I tend to hide out in the corner. I guess it's just the assistant in me and the way coming up in the studio, like the fly in the wall mentality. And whenever I work or I'm in a room with a bunch of people I don't know or have never met or never had any interactions with, the first thing I do is jump on that wall and just start watching. And I start just seeing what their mannerisms are, what they do, their temperament. And I study them. I, by the time I'm done, I could write a psych report on those people. And uh, I don't dare even think or make the assumption that I know anything until I know it. And that is the best advice I can give you. Whenever you're in a situation when you don't know them personally or have any experience with them, just sit back and observe because you'll be surprised how much people let out and then you'll know exactly where to fit in. You're welcome. I wanted to ask you uh, about. Um, I mean, I was thinking it's so much stuff that you know that that shoot them out, buddy. That's so, so much stuff that you've done, but um, uh, I think something that uh, that I listen to a lot uh, that you've done is um, the uh, Loose album by Nelly, Nelly Furtado. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, just overall, I, lo- I love that album. Just from you know from front to back, and I know that you. Thank you. You mixed uh, and recorded, you know, uh, the majority of that album, I you know. On that album, yeah. So, uh, just what, what what was it like, you know, just to th- work, working on that album, you know, from from you know, since you you got to see just from the beginning all the way to the end, what was it like working on that album? Man, that album was was crazy because, you know, when that album was really what broke it open for us, and we did that album in two thousand five, and then that album was what set it up that's what gave us our run that's what gave me and tim like that's what set it up was that record the success that that record had was just it was just crazy i mean we came out with that then we came with justin then we came with tim's album i mean within that time span we looked at like selling almost like 12 million records in a short period of time and we had like 12 number ones like it was just that that was just you couldn't understand at the time when you're going through it like yo is this really happening like can't go wrong so working on that album was was unreal because we, at that time, everybody had counted us out. They were like, yo, Tim's washed up. He has this, this sucker young engineer. I don't know what he's doing and blah, blah, blah. And, and we just didn't care. So we were just experimenting. Like, the reason why I Say It Right sounds like that is because literally, like, I had a different mic for almost every, like, different harmony. We were trying different vocal chains. Like, we just experimented. And Nelly had nothing to lose either because... She hadn't been out in so long. It was just kind of like we all had our shot. Like Danger, too. Danger worked on that record. Jim Beans, like, that was everybody's coming out record. Like, we all had a lot to prove. 
So we just experimented, man. That was it. That's why that record sounded like that, and that's why it really caught on because there was just we just experimented so much during the making of that album, and and trying to really come up with something. And that's really the album that started my mixing career because they wanted somebody else to mix that record, and that engineer actually tried to mix. But it's the same thing. Like I had been mixing that record for like seven months, and then they'd like, "Yo, you got two days to remix this whole record." Like. It didn't work, so I ended up getting that, and that ended up opening the floodgates for me because that shot me up to the top of the list of mixers. And then all of a sudden, it's just like, yo, can you work on this? Yo, can you do that? I'm like, yeah, for sure. So it was an incredible experience to work on that record. It's probably one of my favorite albums that I've ever worked on. That and Tim Shock Value and Chris Cornell Scream album are probably some of the albums that I hold dear. And Madonna's MDNA album, I had a lot of fun making that record too. Yo, that that breakdown. I just wanted to ask you last question. I promise, but that uh, that the breakdown on glow. Like, what did you, what were you thinking about when you did that? Because I don't know. I've been experimenting with switching up drums like that. That's been kind of like a trademark thing that I've done for a long time. And uh, I don't know, man. I just sometimes I just get in the zone. I just hear things, and I let my hands kind of just do those cuts and edits, and that's how they come out. A lot of that, believe it or not, is on the console because I always keep stuff on the console. So that's the benefit I get. So I'm always like switching up tracks. I would just go and start hitting delays and stuff and just creating those breaks. And that's why a lot of them sound kind of like a bit unique because that's they're just on the fly. So I can't tell you what I was thinking, but I tell you, I thought I knew when I did. I was like, oh yeah, this is gonna be this fresh. They're gonna, they're gonna, let's go get them. Let's go get them. And so, yeah. all right. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks. Hi, how are you? How are you? Fine, thank you. Um, I just have a question. I love everything about this industry. I, I enjoy doing music. I enjoy recording. I enjoy producing. I enjoy, uh, enjoy show production. And I've done a lot of things like, like I don't know, I've, do, I've done like recordings, uh, productions, music for film. And a lot of people just have told me that I need to focus on, on just one thing and, and uh, focus all my thoughts in that and keep doing just one thing. And I don't know actually what to do right now because I love everything. Well, that's the, you're doing the right thing. You just got to find what you, you got to find your niche. It's good to do a lot of things. Like I do that now, but when I started off, it was like, I always wanted to be a producer. That was the end game for me. Like I wanted to be, actually I wanted to be an executive, but producer was on the top of that list. But I was like, yo, I, all right, let me, how can I be a producer? Well, engineer will give me the opportunity to meet the right people, get my skills right, keep me in the studio, develop me, get to work with other producers. That was the main thing. I wanted to be a producer, so like, how can I be a producer? Well, if I'm an engineer and I'm their engineer, I'm seeing these producers create these records, then I, I could figure out what works for me. Um, I'm the type of person, man, that I, I literally, like, I will burn all the ships I will put all my eggs in one basket and I will just put it all, I mean, that's what works for me and that's my advice. If you want to really succeed in something, like you got to dedicate to it. You got to literally burn all the ships and go to war by yourself and be like, there's no turning back. Put your back against the wall and be like, yo, I'm going to make it happen. But I had, I knew what I wanted to do. You're still trying to find out what you're trying to do. It's cool what you're doing, man. Go keep out there and keep exploring. Keep looking, keep turning you know as long as you're still developing and still growing then you're still moving in a, in a great direction so as long as you're moving in, as long as you're moving forward there ain't no looking back you know when you're starting to go like ah oh, man maybe i should go do this or maybe i should go build websites and like you're getting out of audio then then you got an issue there you got to fix okay thank you you're welcome all right so well <clears throat> That's going to about wrap it up for us here. Um, but all I have to say is, if you didn't learn from that, I don't know how you'll learn, right? So let's give him a, a round of applause real quick.